Beardy and the Beast Media Club. This is placeholder intro song. All right, this time I won't mess up tragically. I believe you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us at the Beardy and the Beast Media Club, a discussion of a piece of media where we won't hide from spoilers. We'll not attack those spoilers in the street while the lost watch on. We are available here and on many other services with the full list at beardyandthebeast.com. Give us a like, share, or join the conversation in the comments below. My name is Drew, and of course, because Canadian boys kinda almost never die, we have Devin. Hey. Today we'll be discussing the 2016 Japanese film Haruko Azumi is Missing. So Devin, what did you see painted on the walls? Um, it was, I saw a little bit of confusion. <laughs> uh, I think, I think it's a film that, I think I'd get more on it on a second watch. Mm. Um, like, I enjoyed it. I was very interested in it. And some of this might be just a lost in translation aspect. <laughs> that's always there when, when you watch a foreign film. I couldn't figure out what genre I was watching and it didn't take me out of the film, but I think it stopped me from like getting deeper in fully, it. Yeah. Fully appreciating what it was. So um, by that, I kind of had the thought that maybe it was a ghost story. Maybe it was a story that was being told with, in, with time skips, like um, Memento, for example. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of threw me off a little bit. Um, but I would really like to watch it again. And I, I think I, I would highly suggest it. Like, this is my second viewing. Mm -hmm. And I definitely picked up more out of it. The, I think when I watched it was four years ago now. When it first came out, type thing? Yeah, Close like to. about a year after or something. Yeah, I had uh, mess messaged you beforehand, and I was like, hey, do you want a warning about this film? And you were like, nah, I'd prefer not to have one. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so the warning I was going to give you was just going to be two words, nonlinear storytelling. Yeah. I guess those are both hyphenates, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just to yeah, and... prep you for that, but you were like, "No, I'm good," and I'm like, "Okay, okay." Well, and I mean, it, it's I didn't like I got that it was a non-linear storytelling. Mm. I think again, this could be just like a bit of again, lost in translation is kind of the best way I can think of it. It wasn't necessarily clear where, what time skips we were jumping to. Mm -hmm. Like there, there was a couple of clear ones. Like there was a couple of flashbacks to like, with the three young girls, which I don't think were the three main protagonists. I think there were like two of them. Yes. Like that was clear. Uh, it became a little bit more clear with like near the end where we're getting clips. I'm pretty sure we we're getting clips at the beginning, but there was just again little jumps that it was a little difficult to place where the timelines were. Mm -hmm. I think some of it might have changed because, um, of course, we watched subtitles, but the subtitles we had didn't always translate the text on the screen. So there was like a couple sections where we had like a text message conversation. I have no idea what was lost there. Mm -hmm. I think um, in that I the screen, some of the major ones there where it was like a wall of text were just people commenting on the, like the art or about the graffiti all over the place and like development of that story, which I'd like to kind of talk about later. I'd I'd like to hop in on this, this this little little section will be. Drew poops on the film that he liked and suggested. Um, <laughs> I, I caught it more this time around the non-linear storytelling parts where it was jumping between the 
three primary storylines i thought was done very well but the time skips and the dream sequences that were interlaced with that jumbled it up it made it confusing and made you go am i in the other story now or oh no this is a dream sequence oh no this is actually three months ago like it wasn't allowing me to put it chronologically yeah like it didn't it's like what's what's a good way say say you have a puzzle in front of you and you put all those puzzle pieces together and you have one remaining one and you it fits that spot but the image is printed upside down on that piece yeah when you put it on the puzzle it's supposed to be there but it just does not seem right yeah and and to play on that a little bit like with you know that it's like they did a couple things fairly good like you know there were scenes that was clearly i've seen this this place before um i'm thinking of a couple of the places where they were doing the tagging mm. you know when when he first yeah. you know did the enjoy and stuff like that it's like okay i recognize this place and like i was expecting to go back there like um there's a spot where they had like a broken wall when they were tagging and i expected to go back there and find something happening there and we kind of did but again not in a way that i could tell what the timeline of it was so it kind of left a little bit of a broken messaging in my mind i'm like is she actually missing or was that a poster from years ago when she had gone missing and then was found like i i think that part was purposeful mm-hmm. um keeping it like Especially when they introduce uh, Soga and you're like, oh, this guy's a creep, like, making you wonder, like, was she, did she die, did she wander off, did she swim into the ocean, did she get murdered by some creepo? But I think I think the underlying foundation of what you're saying, like, the structure of the places didn't have clear signs of where it was chronologically speaking yeah exactly and and it left so like while i was watching it because of that there was things like i almost expected the vari- the virality of the tagging to negatively hit haruko because i was almost expected but she wasn't missing and i almost expected her like their family to get see something on social media about this Mm. um right because i i if i remember correctly there was a scene near the end where i think they were tagging a window but she was in the shop at the time while they were while they were tagging something it's like but she's right there oh i think um i think i remember that and i think that was a they did this technique a few times where it was a pan between these the stories Mm-hmm. and that was the jump but they it was clear to me what had happened but i thought it was too smooth mm. it made it feel like it was in the same place in the same time i don't think that shop spe- scene was supposed to be them tagging while she was in there it yeah. was she was in there and then they, they used that window as the pivot okay to the other but it wasn't clear yeah and because we've seen mm-hmm. western films um swear i'm gonna name the wrong film i want to say one of the crash films was like that it's the weird canadian one and there's the other one where it was like an accident about an accident and it's these four stories that do all kind of cross into each other right Mm -hmm. so that's what i thought they were going for with that if it was supposed to be a transition through a time skip uh i didn't get that and i'm not really sure because like a lot of films where they have that you've got clear there's clear visual differences mm-hmm. like memento is very clearly black and white scenes the color scenes you kind of know what's going on yeah or at least that way there so there's something to tell us that there's a time shift and i didn't get that in this i, I figure like let's say this was done in an anime i could see them having clearly done a difference in in art style or mm. something to have that distinction the only real clear 
chronological marker that I got was uh, the the friend. I think Ari. He was the co-worker of Ina, and uh, the old friend of Haruko. Mm -hmm. And there was kind of like her her little mini storyline is she worked at a bar, and she she met a baseball player, and then. She married that baseball player, but then, like, got pregnant and then divorced him, or he cheated on her, and then came back, and then had that conversation with Haruko at a, like, a party. Yeah. And then at the end, like, with with her child, and Haruko met, meet up with Aina at, like, the very end scene there. Yeah. So she, she's the, fundamentally, the only pin in the story that, like allows you to lay everything upon it you essentially structure everything and every story on her yeah and i don't think she was present enough for them to have used her as such a baseline yeah there wasn't um an ever present and and that's just one of the difficulties when it comes to disjointed timelines is you need to have something like that clearly there mm -hmm. right so so that character almost needs to be ever present in the different stages. So we have, have an anchor to go to, right? Um, if they had a section of her being pregnant and how that laid in the storyline there, I think that would have structured things out quite well. Yeah. But I do, I do agree having some type of visual difference would be, I mean, anime can even do a different type of shading or a color gradient. I mean, this, this movie wouldn't be able to pull a memento, but they could have done something. Yeah. Uh, I... Maybe like Haruko Azumi. Actually, we this has been kind of mentioned to me in the past uh, by you, indicating like the smallest change you could do to improve a film. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be to slightly saturate Ino scenes and slightly muddle Haruko's so they're grayer. Yeah. Would help understand that shift. Because then if we go back to that shop scene, it would go from the muddled to the saturated. Yeah, exactly. And the few things that I saw that again because I knew it was like again, I had that feeling that this was a disjointed mm -hmm. timeline. Like it was between that and a ghost story. Yeah. Um, Either would have been fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I saw things like, again, um, the first place where they were tagging, mm -hmm. like when, you know, painted the big orange enjoy. Like, enjoy and like the F yeah. word. and Yeah. When they had that, I'm like, okay, this is a clear thing. And I saw it again in a later scene. I'm like, okay, well, so in the timeline, this is clearly after that. But I don't ever remember seeing a scene there without the tag. The, uh, I believe there's two. I, might I think be they both happened before the tag, didn't they? Um, so the scenes that I remember kind of in that under the bridge or like industrial parking lot area, whatever that place is, yeah. was the, uh, the tagging. The partying of the schoolgirls. Yeah. The scene with Haruko and Soga where she was like, I want to be with you. Yeah. And then, yeah, the painting. Did I say? I mentioned the painting. Yeah. Yeah, those are the scenes I remember there. Yeah. But I always remember the tag there. So, like, when Haruko was there, you know. Pre preaching her love there the tag was in the background so that happened after the graffiti started i see what you mean i i don't remember seeing that i'm wondering if the i really hope that's not a production oversight i hope that was purposeful i don't remember seeing it like i i just assumed it wasn't there mm -hmm. i i i almost feel it would have been a little bit better if it had been a ghost story instead of a disjointed timeline for another reason as well. Mm. It would have made Haruko and 
Aina's meeting in the in the dreamland would have made more sense because it almost felt out of nowhere because we hadn't seen these characters interact don't think we really saw her following her mm -hmm. seeing her around or anything and it would have made more sense for her to to kind of just be there and then and then be seen afterwards and i guess there's a kind of underlying thought question left that azumi is more directly tied to the gangs is the only other thing i could kind of think of but even then it doesn't quite fit it's like we, we just didn't get the relationships and the 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 meetings when we did have them would have almost made more sense to me if it was a ghost story a ghost story right but i mean if and if, I, if you pull if you watch this we we could we could definitely like on a rewatch totally do this like Haruko Izumi is missing as a ghost story mm -hmm. much in the way that i watch you know uh my my neighbor totoro is a ghost story that's how i watch it yeah the 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 prequels are Darth Jar Jar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it would be more interesting that way. And it actually, I'm wondering if this was a directorial decision and a writing decision to keep you guessing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're being put in the place that you're supposed to be. As in, yeah. do we want to make this more... We want it. We want the viewer to not be unsure of what they're seeing, and yeah. what type of genre it's in. Yeah, because if they did, if if that was the purpose, they did it really well. Yeah. If it's not the purpose, then they failed in a bunch of places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there, there's one. Really, there's only one scene that made me go, "Oh, this isn't a ghost story," and that's the very end one, because, like, I could have un understand. Haruko and Aina meeting when they're going to the beach but why was the third one there because she didn't seem to have anything that was like I mean she had her issues but I didn't get the same strife from her as a character well I mean if if we're talking about our hypothetical movie when she's at the playland or whatever and she interacts if Aina and Haruko uh, interact that's her welcoming her to the afterlife right the issue with it is what was the the third person like the, the names are oh Ari, Ari and the daughter they they went to been dead man and that's where it kind of falls apart i'm just yeah. saying the ending seems rushed yeah i believe this is a novel adaptation mm -hmm. so i mean that as as we know books and movies but it seems like they just tried to tie everything up too quickly. I mean, we, we've talked about Japanese uh, storytelling a lot, how it's very back-end heavy. Mm -hmm. It ramps up very slowly and then kind of spikes and then drops almost immediately, if it even drops. Yeah. Um, but that did, it, it didn't seem the case here. It definitely seemed like just trying to tie up everything it could as quickly as possible. And I mean, it did in some aspects. Mm -hmm. What are the names? Manabu and Yukio Tagashi, uh, the yeah. two boys that were with Aina. Their, their storyline was very clear. Yeah. Had to be like a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. Uh, Aina's, I, I guess you could say the same. Haruko's kind of, yeah, there is, there's an, there is an etherealness to Hiroko Izumi's storyline that really yeah. does give it that ghost feel. Yeah. Like she's literally got no interaction except for the one place where you're pretty sure she, the one's going to, you know, off herself <laughs> when she steps in. Even the idea of, oh no, the, the whole Japanese girls never die thing, right? It's like, wouldn't you, like, it was just that, wouldn't you imagine that all of these missing people, they're actually just fine right again it's that etherealness and yeah it makes me wonder like i think i almost like i would have had the same questions but i almost would have been a little happier if it had ended pretty much right after 
those two characters met, met uh, in Dreamland. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of going to the beach is fine, but again, you need something else to tie those characters in. Well, what I was wondering is if this was calling back to, I think it's called uh, Johatsu, the people in Japan who just like disappear without a trace. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, half the time it's to escape debt. But it's just like people who purposefully vanish from their established lives without a trace. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if it was calling calling to that. But then the whole line on it about like women being pressed on their lives and their situations and finding power within themselves, that wouldn't work alongside the Juhatsu, because that mm -hmm. would be like a fight versus flight situation. Yeah. To van vanish like that would be flight. Hmm. There's yeah. There's definitely this this odd puzzle piece here, and that's what confuses yeah. me about the film. Yeah, because that was another thought that I thought um that concept just the uh, I'm just going to disappear myself. Mm -hmm. I I thought that as a possibility as well, and, and again, this is it would have needed something else for it to be that. So wasn't quite sure how they were going with that. If it was that going missing, mm -hmm. I almost would have expected a scene of, you know, Haruko being told to go get the toilet paper again, and just a scene with her not there. Mm. Right? Even something like that would have been, you know, it was that whole, yep, just gone out to get some smokes. <laughs> well, in our, in our imaginary hypothetical ghost movie, there, should, there shouldn't have been any interaction about the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it should there should have been no interaction between Haruko Izumi and her family I assume they were um, yeah like the storylines and the non-linear storytelling there was definitely something muddled in there something odd and misplaced I, I don't know if it's a cultural thing I think it might have been just a series of oversights but what I think they did well was kind of some some of the little tidbits non direct storytelling mm -hmm. for instance my one of my favorite ones was the uh like it starts up with a poster missing missing high school student yeah and then of course like in my head canon for this entire movie the the reason why there was the school this girl <laughs> gang of schoolgirls that were just absolutely trouncing men in the street was um them taking back power from type of people who would like abduct this high school girl yeah and then how that interacts in with the story itself the the other thing i liked was the whole like let's go to the sea thing between azumi and soga and they're staring at that picture and then later on as things are falling apart she like approaches that and it's a puzzle and like the pieces have fallen out I really liked that too, actually. Yeah, I, I, that was a nice touch. It was, yeah, it was like the cherry on the Sunday there, mm -hmm. and then as far as the the sea concept, it being clear in that final like car scene that they were going to the sea, but they were like doing it for themselves. Effectively, yeah. the three independent women and this child, yeah. which I mean, given the context of the film, it's probably a little girl. Yeah. Well. I mean, that's another thing, though, that muddled it for me, mm. because I liked the tie-in of going to going to the sea. That made perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it goes into my head again. It's like, okay, so is this supposed to be the afterlife again? Because that in, in Western media, that would have almost been what you've seen. Um, we did Requiem mm. before, and, and that's pretty much exactly how it, you know, that, that was a big part of the ending them going back to the boardwalk mm -hmm. so that's the feeling i got and then the confusion it should almost you know what it it should have almost been a continuation of the dream sequence mm -hmm. it should have been the start at night she burns the poster goes into the uh, film projection on the wall as they talk and then they kind of do that thing where it's like oh it's it's day now somehow and they walk towards the car and all the people who are important to Aina are there or at least have had major roles in her life up to this point 
So you have her coworker who gave her the dream to become a nail uh, a aesthetician, and yeah. then uh, this person who she's never met, but she knows the details of her face so intrinsically. Yeah. That would have been a nice little touch, but the, the only thing I can assume is that I think that's the English English name of the film, Japanese Girls Never Die. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't think these characters are dead. There's... Even the title does that, though. Because that title, actually either title, kind of does this. The Japanese Girls Never Die brings to my mind the almost like an all dogs go to heaven type thing. Mm. <laughs> Where it's like, no, don't worry, they never die, they're in a better place, they're happier. Right, and and that and when that line is actually uttered in the movie, that's actually what they say. Don't worry, all these missing girls—they're not dead; they're just in a better place. You see this idea of like Schrodinger's Japanese girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is she is she dead or alive? I guess. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we're we're pro. I feel like we're exactly where the filmmaker wants us to be, having this mm -hmm. contemplation of whether or not. Rokozumi is missing and because we're looking at this with a more analytical point of view the inconsistencies are what are preventing us from having a conversation of no she's totally alive dude <laughs> the the inclusion of Ari and the, da the daughter I think it's Ari anyway you might be using the wrong um, I think it's, it's, it's an A Aina. no I know it's the young girl Ari's oh. the friend and co-worker that has the uh, daughter oh right yeah she's I the one that who married the baseball player and had a child. i thought the three names were that there's azumi aina and hitomi hitomi i think hitomi was the third friend of azumi and eri the one mm. that soga was asking about and went hey she moved away right okay right all right nope that clicks that being said, I want to talk a bit more about the characters individually themselves. Shoga had this intentionally confusing aspect to the plot, purely there as like this massive red herring to make you think that because he's just so weird and creepy, but yeah. to make you think, did this guy kill Azumi? Yeah, definitely. Well, definitely seemed detached, not emotional. Mm -hmm. Maybe not calculating, but you, you could see the at any point the storyline going like him having like killed her or done some crazy creepy thing. Yeah. My 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 only I mean props to that actor. Pulled off the role really well. Like the mm. like all I got was feeling from him and that was like just disconnected, creepy and weird. That's the only thing yeah. I could write from him. Barely said anything. Did like He's being responsible, and he's like, no condom, we're not going to do it. I was just like, that entire interaction was like awkward and weird, but I was like, I get what you're saying. Well, that actually connects to another more, I guess, kind of the thematic confusion that, I, that I've seen here. Mm. So one of the, the things the film seemed to be going for was just a role reversal. Like a, a, a men in of men and women what we traditionally see yeah there was right? definitely so, scenes like that sure yeah and it, it confused me a little bit because it wasn't i don't think they played on it enough or they stopped it from ha actually happening so the idea of you get the girls it's like yes the men are being told not to go out walking alone at night <laughs> um even that lead up to the sex scene the, to the sex scene there was a similar type of thing it was her almost pushing mm. then it, if that was the message even that got that whole role reversal thing kind of got muddled with well, the, many... the sales office right it well there's too too many layers to the sex scene to really have it pay off in that same manner because mm. how disconnected and un what's the opposite of intense <laughs> dispassionate dispassionate <laughs> how dispassionate both of them were about this entire situation it it felt i didn't even think about the whole role, role re reversal part just because i was lost in 
yeah, how dispassionate and weird that sex scene was. That probably interfered with me from me having seen it. Mm. Though it is, I do appreciate that it wasn't beating me over the head with it. Yeah. Constantly, because I get it, but I get back to the, the storytelling here. Mm. Yeah, it was all in the lead up in particular that <clears throat> that I felt that role reversal aspect. Mm. It definitely felt like she was the one pressuring him. Yeah. I think it was done well, but if that's what they were going for, there wasn't enough, is it? There wasn't enough threads of it throughout. And in that case, if we were to choose that scene directly, the juxtaposition with uh, Aino and Yukio Tagashi's sex scene that happened at the same time, like that was more passionate, it was more tense. They seemed to be actually enjoying what they were doing. So it, it was like they were just trying to throw too many concepts and themes during that two minutes film. Yeah. And it, it's not even that they were juxtaposing the role of reversal versus like the role as perceived. Yeah. In those two scenes, it was literally like the juxtaposition I was got, got had nothing to do. I mean, I get what you're saying. It was definitely yeah. there. It's just. Yeah. yeah. I, and I agree with you because like that, that juxtaposition. Took away didn't from it. match it yeah, yeah it took away from it that juxtaposition was again here's a couple of people who are passionate here's a couple of people who aren't <laughs> to me the juxtaposition the better juxtaposition was the passionate cry about i love you <laughs> compared to that sex scene mm -hmm. i'm sure we've talked about this before a few times like i generally try to look up tropes and trivia and such the movies after i watch it mm -hmm. i can't find anything <laughs> things like the lack of music generally in it so i'm gonna make an assumption that this is an anti film I can't find anything to to confirm that, but just based off of the lack of anything I can find on it. So I haven't run into that before. I, de so I definitely I'm getting... could see this as a, like a Sundancer, you know? Yeah. I could see that. Yeah, so I think, and there's kind of that almost art house feel to some of it in the, the way the storytelling's done. Yeah, kind of poppy too. Yeah, so I'm not sure if there might be something with the filmmakers maybe not being the most experienced. I didn't really check what they've done, which well, it could, could almost fill some of those holes as well. It could be also experimenting for experiment's sake. Mm, that's true. I can see that a lot. If we if we were to segment this into each feature of it, I think individually they would all do well. Mm -hmm. So, like, we've already mentioned that the nonlinear storytelling itself was fine. And then separate from that, if the objective was for it to have you guessing what it was thematically, constantly, then that was fine and it achieved what it did. If we were to talk about role reversals and discovering oneself and finding power, like, it would also have done that fine as well. Yeah. But uh, and there's a few other aspects, but when you start laying them on top, I wouldn't say it's sloppy. I would say discordant. Yeah, discordant. Yeah, it, it's it's why in the back of my mind, I'm almost going with again just that idea of inexperienced. Like they, I definitely felt that everyone in the film knew what they were trying to do, and nothing felt out of place in that regards. It was just inexperienced is almost what i want to say because it it was just missing that there there was something in the mix that was missing mm -hmm. it's the the idea of i know i'm painting something red versus i know i'm uh, versus i know i'm painting something scarlet mm. at a glance it looks the same but if you if you know you're gonna know well you know you just need that little bit of that little slight different pigmentation to make it come together how it's actually being envisioned and that's what i felt was there it's almost like yeah it's just like an ingredient was missing and i'm not quite convinced it was deliberate right i think the idea of the ambiguity of the of what we're talking about overall is accurate just i think they got the intended effect but almost stumbled upon it and supposed to actually 
The way that you can easily tell that something is odd here is that we're talking about the filmmaking and the themes and not the characters and how they interact with them directly. So what mm -hmm. I mean is we have this outline of a film in our heads, how we perceived it and that sort of thing. And then on top of that, we're laying these characters, mm -hmm. just paper dolls on this uh, scene that was put on and how it fits within this. I don't know if I'm describing that well, but it's just something odd, so, something weird. And I mean, I can theorize until the cows come home. I think we've we put out a, f a few good ideas as far as yeah. that goes. <laughs> the office worker sure did piss me off, though. <laughs> what was really interesting to me before we kind of uh, get into it is the female co-worker who was marrying the Frenchman. Mm -hmm. They had talked down about this lady so many times. Maybe that was Ari. I think that might be. Okay. <laughs> so I was in a weird place while watching this film. So yeah. if I got the names wrong, I got the right. So feel free you to. You would never do something like that. <laughs> no, feel feel free to do a takedown of me in the comments. Uh, yeah, a whole different film. But she, their reaction when finding out that this person they had made fun of so many times was like marrying a Frenchman and like moving to Africa. I, I thought it was super hilarious because these are supposed to be like well-to-do and obviously sexist businessmen doing their well-to-do sexist businessmen things. But as I understand it, there's a type of pedestalness that is put on the French from the Japanese. Yeah. To the point where like, there's programs for people who have gone to visit France and were so disappointed with by what had what they had experienced. They have to actually go through this as if it was like a form of very mild PTSD because they were let down that bad. But anyways, I just them knowing that little that little thing, I don't know if it's still knowing that was a thing in the past. Just knowing that little bit and how much that enhanced the reaction. So there was a little cultural bit there. Yeah. Well, but, while I didn't know the whole cultural bit of that, they did mention something. It's like, yep, yeah, no, they like the French. Like, I think she mentioned that. Yeah, I like the French. Like, um, which is nice because from the international side, if you, again, lost in translation is a big thing that can happen in these types of mm. types of films. So just having that little bit of cultural explanation, mm. or at least character explanation, barring that, it was a nice touch. And <laughs> it was really a, it was a nice slap in the face <laughs> to them. I didn't notice the first time around, but like after they had told her that, she, like she had should dress more feminine, and yeah. then in like there's only three scenes, well four scenes with them I think, but it, after that occurrence, in the I think it was the second scene with them she was wearing a skirt. Yeah, I was like, Azumi, no. <laughs> and then the I think technically the fourth scene with them. Uh, she was wearing pants again. Yeah. And I was just like, yes. Freaking don't have to listen to those jerk wads. And I didn't I didn't realize at first, but she had she had a dream sequence where the the gang of schoolgirls were beating up her coworker, her bosses there. Yeah. It took me a while to realize. I'm like, oh wait a minute. And then I'm like, where where am I sitting? I think yeah, it's gonna be the dream sequences that were pulling me out. Well again, which of them were dream sequences and which was actually happening? With, with with the gangs mm. because it, the gangs were clearly happening because the, the only the strongest tie to reality is is the taggers and they're talking about the gangs and they're going oh god did we cause this and they then, had that conversation well and so, manabu was even beat up by them so they yeah. exist yeah so is it a dream sequence or did something happen to them i think that one was a dream sequence it was dark and there was a lot of reds i think that was part of it mm. like visually i could tell um i could be wrong yeah but even then there was daytime what could only be construed as dream sequences so manabu, manabu was staring at the graffiti and like saw her face saw yeah. Azumi's face. and then of course the schoolgirls at the end when they were doing finger guns at the police and the police were falling over like, the police aren't going to do that. Yeah. Like, they were wielding real guns. Yeah. That that scene, I'm kind of like... It was, I, it was fun. I don't, it was fun, but I'm like, I don't know what's happening here. And 
it could be that I missed the idea of dream sequence. Like, I, I honestly don't think I realized. I think you're seeing more dream sequences than I did. Mm. Right. So like the only one that I immediately saw as a, as a dream sequence was that final one. And then like, and a couple of flashbacks, but I'm like, it threw me off because again, I didn't see quite the lead up to that police scene. Mm. <laughs> right. Though I'm going to step back to that possible ghost story feel that, Oh, I think I'm right about Ari. I think. Okay. <laughs> I think Hiroko was the co worker uh, under the sexist boss. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just need to. No, that's that fine. <laughs> like that dream sequence at the very end, I actually almost saw that fitting in with my ghost story theory again. Mm. The Japanese girls never die, they dead. <laughs> See, if there was something in the story that what pulls me out of that, and it's the only little piece of it, is Aerie. Mm. Why is she there in that car? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, she's the biggest mystery. <laughs> and that's why, like, it all comes down to her having just needed a, a more stable and full part in the movie. Yeah. Would have yeah. pulled it all together. And unfortunately, oh. she would have had to die at the end. Oh. She's the one who left the country isn't she remember they talked about getting pregnant and leaving the country mm. what if she never actually came back she's in another one of the missing girls oh okay i get i get what you're saying jeepers because all right I, i'm i'm not 100 percent certain which of the characters we're talking to when they flash back to being kids in, in that one scene i, I think that's that's not Haruko, that's the other two, right? So you have... <laughs> it is Azumi, it is uh, Eri, and it is the girl that Soba wanted, which was Hitomi. Okay, because one of them... Because in that, that flashback, they were talking about... It sounded like their family died, and they, they said, why can't I just be in there with her? Be in the grave with them. Oh my god, I just thought of something. Yep. So the interaction between Soba and Azumi. Mm -hmm. Soba goes, what happened to Hitomi? And Azumi was like, yeah, she, she left, she moved away. She's no longer here. So if we were to make this entire thing into a ghost story, yeah, I'm going to lay it out. We're, go we're going rogue here. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're going rogue here because something's weird about this story and I need, I need it to make sense in my head right now. Hitomi's missing. She was the school, the high school girl that went missing. That sparked the girl gang. Soba, also dead. And that's the reason why Soba and Hitomi were interacting in, in, in that one scene, were interacting in the market. Don't think anyone else interacts with Soba. Yeah, I can't remember anything clear. Okay. So if if Azumi dies, then that dream se the dream sequences and the seeing her face make a whole lot of sense. I'm still trying to fit in Eri, because there wasn't anything indicating that her and her daughter died, but there might be a piece. This is where I thought Eri was Hitomi, so I think that kind of lays on on this as well. She matched that matched her best. I feel skin could have just been that she yeah I thought that she was the one who moved away for for a moment because I as soon as you mentioned best for me. yeah as soon as you mentioned ghost stories the first thing that came to my head was that convertible was the was the boat for the river sticks and yeah. and Ari would have been the the tollman yeah but. I mean, that's not the reference they were giving, but that's the first thing in mind. But the only thing that falls out there is Aaron. I think, like, on another watch, we could put it in. Maybe this is just a, a ghost story and, like, half the cast are dead. And when... does, does that mean that the policemen shot all the schoolgirls and it went directly from them being confronted into an afterlife sequence? That's what I'm thinking. So, like, you don't see them. All of a sudden, them. Yeah. Because... Cause... Again, that was the clearest spot to me of it feeling dreamy. 
because it felt very realistic. And then they did the, you know, yeah. they were copying the cartoon and it was immediately dreamy. I actually like, remember I, that scene completely differently than what had happened. Hmm. I remember them reversed. Hmm. As in, they came out and then they pulled out the finger guns and then it went into the cartoon sequence. Oh, okay. But it was it was the same uh, video. <laughs> like the same version <laughs> so i know that did not change yeah yeah I, I i think that's what they're going for so i can't quite remember um, maybe you notice it when the policeman put up the second mis like replacing the missing persons poster did we actually see who's on that poster oh are we are we wondering if it's Ina or ari yeah that's exactly what i'm wondering oh uh this this actually needs to be found out. So, do to do. This is your snack break. Get up out your chair. Do some capitalism. Get yourself a drink. <laughs> <laughs> like and subscribe. As a background note, while Drew is looking this up, I normally, in my work when we're recording these, I tend to have the video up just in case we need to reference something. This is the first time that I haven't had the video up, and the first time where it's like, no, we actually need to reference this. <laughs> it's not clear. Two people on that poster. Is mm. that the is that the is that the coworker? Wait. That's the coworker. That looks like the coworker. Oh are all the women in this film dead? I I think they might be. Is this is this a ghost story question mark? I think they might be. <laughs> and there's two people on that poster. One of them is wearing like a plaid schoolgirl style dress. Yeah. I think I saw that. And we know that Hiroko, at least at work, doesn't wear dresses. Doesn't mean she can't in her private life. I watched it like a dozen times. Face to my screen, I couldn't, couldn't tell. Yeah. I, I think this is the biggest... Remember I was talking about earlier, it's like it would have been nice to see what these text messages were. Because mm. like, there was actually a text message conversation that that uh, wasn't in the translation, that, in the subtitles that, that we were seeing. I want to... There's names on that poster. What that scene does show is that the police officer seems more upset about his ice cream bar or his uh, popsicle than it's about putting up a picture for missing girls. Yeah. <laughs> With that being said, like... Just look at the state of that board. <laughs> I mean, somebody did lose their cat. Yeah. We'll have to ponder about this. We might might have to put this on the like the like the in person revisit sort of thing. Put the hookah out and just hang out and watch this thing mm -hmm. and actually do like a live theory crafting on it. Because I feel we your ghost story theory is either spot on or just completely off. Mm -hmm. you're like you've either nailed it on the head or you're completely wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and i i i need to know yeah. one of the things I, I would have liked if the like the women in this film had gained strength or found strength within them or any of those tropes because mm. they were pretty much just lost aimless and then they just existed. They didn't find themselves. The closest was probably Ana. But did she die? If she died, that throws it all out the window. Because that conversation, Again, how come you're here? I came to die. Why must you die? Them not finding themselves makes more sense if this is a ghost story. Okay. I get what you're saying. <laughs> I, I get what like, you're putting down. I, I think... Everything is leading. So just leading whole... to that for me. So then that that means this film is just a whole bunch of sexism, and then the girls die. That's this film in a sentence. That being said, yeah. you know what? I actually really like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> as discordant as I think it is at this point in time, and I tell you, it makes less sense to me on my second watching. I would definitely give this one. Five uh, violent schoolgirl gang members of a potential eight. Yeah, I like that. It, it's definitely above average. I think there's, again, some holes that we're 
we may have actually patched here as we're talking about this. Or that, that prevented from being that little bit higher. <laughs> or we might have fallen down a hole and missed the point completely. <laughs> that is true. But I don't mind some theory crafting. I think this is our most theory craft <laughs> video that we've we've done. Like I know we've done little hit bits here, but Well that's um, that's part of the problem with the film though. Yeah. Because we're Oregon, talking about the themes and not the characters. Well, that's that's not necessarily an issue, though. Yes. Right? Like, I, there's I, a lot of indie films where it's about the themes. The characters are the vehicles. Brush strokes, yeah. Right? They're the brush strokes. They're not what you're supposed to be talking about with the film. I guess. I, I, would, I would like to quickly go through the characters, at least just a general thing for this cast. Yeah, um, sure. Well casted. Very. I think I think everyone suited their parts. Everyone acted well. It's it was believable. Like it was believable, and even like Yukio Tagashi, who was your like, if we were to do like a anime trope, he was your like exuberant one who was over always overreacting. Did that well, but still within a realistic manner. Yeah, uh, Manabu was definitely just kind of lost and going with the flow. And kind of like that closet manipulator. Yep. Like, he was just as bad to Aina as Yukio was. Haruko Azumi. 100% typecast. 100% perfect cast. Even her facial structure suited this movie. Yeah. Like, something about her eyes. That kind of, like, you know, deep-set, lost... I wouldn't say downtrodden. That's not the... Or beaten... Maybe not something so severe, but there's something there about were... her facial expression that you could tell what the character was feeling and what they were supposed to be feeling clearly just by mm -hmm. how she was holding her face. So, yeah. and I mean, couldn't uh, expect any less from the the actress that also plays Megumi from the live action Ronan Kenshin movies. Oh, does she? Yeah, I just saw that and it was, I, a, it was a cool thing. Um, I haven't seen them yet. That's that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I can see that. <laughs> the 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 first one was too many storylines in one movie. Mm. That kind of typical. Anyways, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, casting was great. The act the acting was fantastic. E even like the the main schoolgirl gang member. Mm -hmm. You could tell that she was not only capable, but um, like could definitely take care of herself. And I might even put on one of her other movies onto our watch list called Rise of the Machine Girls. All right, that just sounds awesome. Yeah, so we're we might put that on there. You, I haven't I haven't come into a Beardy and the Beast Media Club leaving more confused than when I've gone in before. Like, at least with the Tale of Princess Kaguya, like, we perfectly, in my opinion, summed it up and yeah. established what the movie was trying to do and et cetera. Yeah. This, this has to be, this has to be art housey, like you said. It's the only thing yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Something independent and experimental. Yeah. I think that's so. again, fully enjoyed it. I definitely want to watch it again. Um, and again, I do think that, yeah. I think the questions, I think the film was designed to make us question things. Mm -hmm. If we're questioning it the right way, that's beside the point. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's art housey, then whatever way we question it is valid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big shrugs. <laughs> I guess yeah. with, with that, I guess I should probably wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this has been the Beard and the Beast Media Club. Join us next time where we discuss Cowboy Bebop knocking on Heaven's Door. If you like what we do, give us a like or a share. Otherwise, join in the conversation in the comments. Check out beardyandthebeast.com for all the places that we can be found. Other than that, uh, campfires and scented candles. All ghost <laughs> stories here. Yeah, have a good one. <laughs>